Put yeah. your hands together for the hosts of Dev Central Connects live from their home studio, Boo Lamb and Jason Rom. Hey there, community. Uh, that's kind of a lie, Peter. It's actually just me today. So, uh, you know, it was uh, originally supposed to be uh, me and Peter was going to be the the backup host, but I, I don't actually have a Peter introducing himself as a host, which would be kind of meta. But um, so I had to use the the me and Boo, even though Boo is on an island somewhere, toes in the sand, uh, hopefully, you know, getting some time in the surf. And, uh, but you know, Peter, Peter has a foundation that's got jackhammered holes and, and mud slinging everywhere. And, and, uh, so he had some, uh, conflict with, uh, some, uh, workers in his house that was going to be loud and distracting. And, and so he's backstage, he's here, uh, but he's not going to be on with us today. So, uh, you know, it is what it is, but I'm, I'm happy to be here anyway, um, uh, without, without my buddies, uh, being here to help. And before we get into the show and introduce our fantastic uh, repeat guest, he's a friend of the show, been here a lot. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some things that you should know about. And one of those things is the State of Application Strategy Report for 2022 is out. Uh, they work months on this thing every year. And it's it's got just an amazing, tremendous amount of data for you to kind of look at where the industry is, where it's going. They have a, you know, in Lori's blog here is talking about, you know, some of the performance aspects of that and looking at challenges in the multi-cloud. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like uh, your financial portfolio, right? You want to diversify so that, uh, you know, your one stock crashes on any given day and you're sad and you want to go crawl up in a hole. Uh, you, if you spread, spread the love out a little bit, uh, that chaos monkey won't, won't get you quite so bad. And so that is the state of application strategy report. You can read about it. Uh, Lori's blog from a couple days ago. Let me add that into the chat. If I can grab that real quick. And that's that one. And so you can go grab that. And uh, she links to the report in there. And then the other one we've talked about on the show actually a couple times in Security Sidebar. Peter has interviewed the guys uh, from uh, the F5 Labs, and they're talking about application application protection report and kind of where the industry is going, uh, where what we're seeing, the trends that we're seeing, and so a lot of good security insights in that. So you you really want to check that out uh, from uh, David Warburton, uh, Malcolm Heath, uh, Sander. Uh, Vinberg as well. And so there's there's lots of good security insights and data. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Download it. You, you know, cozy up on the couch in front of the fireplace. For those of you who are still struggling with cold temperatures, we've been like consistently 20 degrees under normal temperatures here in the Midwest. And it's driving me nuts because I am not a winter guy. I I love the heat. In fact, I, I keep telling my wife, it's like, we're moving south. We're moving south. He's like, no, we're not. Uh, so I'm just going to have to have like two houses uh, eventually one in the warmth uh, during the winter he up here in the, in the North. And then, you know, we can move North when it's like the, the heat of Hades down in Texas and, and Arizona. But, you know, that is enough of that. What we really want to do today is talk about containers. And with that, I will bring on my esteemed guest, uh, Eric Chen. Eric, welcome to the show. Friend of the show. Do you know what appearance this is for you? It's got to be like at least five or six, right? No, I think I haven't achieved like the five timers status yet, but um, I'm still working on it to get my little card. I hear that it's kind of a special thing. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, have Leslie. To keep on in inviting me back until I get to the to that status, but That's I'm working the... on it. Frequent frequent flying status on on the Dev Central connects. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Leslie, if you're watching, yeah, we we need like you know special. Uh, achievements uh, awards for our guests uh, who come on the show. I know uh, Brian McHenry's got to be close to 10 by now. Uh, mm. So, hey, you have your work cut out for you uh, there, Eric. I know. I've got a lot um, to catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're going to talk about containers here in, in a little bit. And, uh, uh, but before that, you've been on the show a lot, but we actually haven't introduced you and, you know, what, what your backstory is. So, how did you get into technology? Mm. So for technology, I, I mean, I did start with uh, 
you know, in my undergrad at college, I actually did start in a computer science degree. But it's a funny thing about college, you know, like for, for people who have ever done, you know, kind of uh, computer science, there's kind of the, you know, book learning, and then there's kind of like, you know, real learning. And I think where I kind of transitioned from kind of learning about technology as a concept or a theory, and then kind of applying it was actually through my involvement with uh, student government during college. And the way that, that came about was that, you know, at the time we had a university calendar and on student council, we kind of realized, you know, hey, there's some shortcomings. It, it's kind of hard to find information. Uh, we really need to talk to the administration about making this better. So we, we met with them and I made some suggestions of, of how they could make improvements. And they're like, well, Eric, that sounds really great. And then they said, well, how would you like to, you know, work here and actually make those improvements? I was like, oh, wow. So that was actually my first experience was doing like kind of hands-on programming, you know, actually taking use cases and requirements and kind of applying them. Um, and it was a great opportunity because it was definitely kind of this transition of just kind of learning about kind of the theory of coding and writing coding and kind of coding exercises. And then actually writing real code, seeing it deployed into production and, you know, having people use it. So that, that was kind of what got me hooked into technology where I just wanted more of that experience of being able to kind of create, share and contribute uh, to the community. Yeah, that, that's that's really fantastic. I, I love hearing people's gateway stories, especially people that don't just like, you know, they're born and <laughs> they know exactly what they want to do. Right. And it's like, you know, um, like my story, I came from aviation into, into, uh, you know, the technology that we use. And, and so, you know, here it's like, uh, I will ask, what was your tech stack at that time? What, what, what did your calendar, uh, experience actually, <laughs> what, what was the front end back end look like? I'm afraid I'm going to probably date myself a little bit, but it was all written in the Perl programming language. And, and for the younger folks, people out there know that's not like kind of something you find on a necklace. It's actually kind of a programming language. And for folks who have been around for a while, you can kind of appreciate, you know, the virtues of Perl. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a first time project. It was uh, it was pretty awesome to just kind of get uh, hands on with it. But yeah, that was my first technology stack was Perl CGI. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say that this it, you said Perl and it's like the CGI bin part of my URL. Just I had flashbacks. So. <laughs> yep, everyone's having those flashbacks right now. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so you know you were in technology. You you kind of got into it on that front. Uh, how did you get involved with F five? What was your uh, what was your initial F five uh, experience? Yeah, the, the way I always like to tell my F five story is that launching point in my undergrad was as a programmer. So the way I always like to think about it is I st started with the application programming stack. But uh, after I finished my undergrad, I ended up working in universities for quite a while. And with each of my jobs, I, it was kind of within the central computing part of the university. And it was first coding, and then it started being more of system administration. And you'll hear a little bit more about that as I talk about containers. And then, I, you know, for people who are familiar with the OSI stack, you know, my running joke is I started at layer seven with all the application programming, and then I kind of worked my way down into getting into the networking and all the routing protocols and all of that. Uh, but through that, uh, I got exposed to F5 technologies, um, and that kind of led me into kind of joining the company almost eight years ago, uh, actually, through um, my uh, solutions engineer that I knew. So that's kind of my wandering path that brought me into F5. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting because I, I, I'm actually the exact opposite story. I started as the router jockey and worked my way up the stack. So it's like I, I feel like... I still have some strengths from my network days, but those are mostly gone. And and I, I have some, you know, kind of middle strengths. And then there's some on the application side. I still like, you know, it's like I've been at it for a long time. And I feel like, I you know, hey, you have that imposter syndrome where you're like, I'm never going to learn this stuff. So... Yeah, but I think it also gives you a full appreciation, right? Because I think, you know, yeah. oftentimes you can kind of get, you know, pigeonholed into I'm just the network person or I'm just the app person or the systems person. And I think if you do have the, you know, the career opportunity to kind of span all these different areas and kind of learn and kind of talk to different people and feel their pain point or, you know, even on the security side of that as well, you, you definitely get kind of a unique perspective on it, which I think is very valuable. And instead of just kind of, 
you know, it's like, do you want to go uh, kind of wide or deep within an area? Um, for me, I always like to kind of sample everything a little bit and kind of check out what's what's out there. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so containers. All right, okay. like when when I first I don't know how many years ago it was when like you know the first Docker kind of things started to to surface as hey we've got this new way of abstracting things. But when I first read it up, I thought that isn't that just Linux jails? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like what. What's different about that? So, you know, with the, your sysadmin sys background stuff, it's like, when when did you first start hearing about, reading about, experimenting with containers? And I'm sure that was a journey. But Yeah, it definitely was. And, and for me, you know, if I had to kind of summarize the journey, I felt like it was a journey of just making it easier to deliver applications. So if we kind of spe step back into kind of, as I said, as working in universities, and some of my first jobs was working on kind of the the campus web server. So these were kind of these large kind of Unix based operating systems. And we had a handful of them. And, you know, part of my my first job responsibilities was just kind of building the web servers and the applications that would support the campus. And back in the day, that was kind of a pain because you have to compile everything from scratch. Um, fast forward a little bit, it's getting better where now we have virtual machines, we can virtualize these kind of pieces of hardware. And now instead of hardware, we have virtual machines. But where I really got exposed to containers, and you kind of mentioned this, is you know oftentimes when you work in universities, you have to worry about multi-tenancy. You could kind of mention uh, the ability to use something like a, a, like a true root or a jail. Um, a lot of this is around this concept of isolation of resources and applications. So to your point, and, and I was doing kind of a little bit of research before this on the show, um, this has actually been around for quite a while. So Linux containers LXC is something that kind of started back in 2008. And, and I had started looking at this in, in my previous role because I was looking for kind of better ways to kind of isolate the system, harden it, make it, you know, more secure for for the environment. You know, when you work on a university and setting, you're always kind of worried maybe your students are getting a little bit too curious and they might try to wreak some havoc. Um, so I was always kind of trying to think about, you know, how can we make this more secure? But one of the shortcomings I found was that there was documentation about Linux containers, but there wasn't really kind of like a framework or kind of guidelines of how to do that. So Docker came around, I think it was like in 2013, was kind of like their first kind of launch. And what I really embraced about Docker compared to kind of the previous technologies was that, you know, in my previous role, I was using things like make files as a way that you would kind of compile software and applications. And that would kind of provide you a recipe of here are the steps that you need to do to kind of build out your software. With Docker, they introduced something that's called a Docker file. So you had this much more you know, systematic way, this this kind of framework of, of how you can kind of take an application, take all of the dependencies and bring it together. And unlike virtual machines where you're kind of virtualizing the, the hardware, what I liked about containers was that it's it's more efficient. Like, you know, for, for people who may not know, containers at the end of the day is building upon that paradigm of kind of uh, the Linux isolation and namespaces and being able to kind of provide a way that you can run your application, but have it run alongside other applications. And, you know, the sysadmin part of me, what I really embraced about this and people who have experienced this pain before can relate to is back in the day, one of the biggest problem as an application uh, creator is you would have different versions of libraries of code and you'd always have to kind of pin your operating system to a particular version otherwise it would kind of create conflict so the real saving grace for me with containers is that it made it so much easier you know almost like the way that you would have an application on your smartphone where you could say take all of these dependencies kind of shrink wrap them together deploy them out there and it was a lot more portable too now you don't have to worry about oh, you know, like uh, how much CPU and memory does this particular host have? You can start to think about kind of how to distribute to, to multiple systems. So that was kind of my first kind of, you know, introduction to kind of, you know, what is a container and eventually Docker at kind of the, the get-go. Okay. Yeah, that, that that's really cool. And, and uh, I, man, I, it doesn't feel like it's been, what is that, nine years since 2013? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's been uh, a beat. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It's like, it, it seems like the years are accelerating. So, you know, Docker kind of came out, you know, 
with a, you know, even though it wasn't a pro necessarily a product at the time, a productized version of, of you know, the, the history of LXC, uh, where did the industry go from there? I mean, was that, it, it seemed to me, at the, you know, at the very initial part, it was like, well, that's really not that big of an evolution. But then within a year, it seemed like it, it was evolutionary. Yeah. And, well, and industry kind of took hold and, and and spread from there. So what what what's come of that since then? So yeah, like the initial Docker to me was it was a it was almost like better package management, right? The idea that you can kind of bring these things together. But when the next evolution, and this is natural, is uh, it became how can you orchestrate all of these containers together? And, and I think it's interesting because. Um, kind of at around the same time that Docker was emerging, there were platforms like OpenStack that were emerging, which was kind of how do you orchestrate virtual machines? And it was kind of a big focus of, you know, we, we need to have these platforms that are capable of orchestrating uh, all of these virtual machines. And what I kind of personally witnessed was this kind of industry shift where people were like, hey, you know, containers might provide a, a better way to host workloads, we need to have a solution so that if you're an enterprise or service provider, you're going to have a way to manage all of these containers across multiple hosts. And you know what I remember at the time is you had companies like Mesosphere, which they, they now have a different name, but they were kind of one of the early adopters of having a container orchestration platform. And it was interesting to me because you know, some of the work that they were doing was initially was just kind of around job management, batch jobs. How do you kind of mm -hmm. run these across multiple hosts independent of containers? And then they kind of embraced containers as they came along. Docker themselves, they they launched a, an enterprise solution that at the time they referred to as Docker Swarm. And I'm, I'm in the Northern Virginia area, and you know it was interesting to me because uh, there was a Docker meetup, one of the first ones that they had, and and they were kind of touting you know how they see the virtue of being able to build this enterprise solution, and, and a lot of that you know Swarm from my perspective was kind of extending the developer experience of what you would have on your workstation and then trying to kind of expand that to kind of um, uh, multiple hosts. But what really, you know, and I think, you know, hindsight is 2020, what really took off was Kubernetes as a project. And, you know, there, a lot of the inspiration was from Google technologies. But what I found, what I personally found interesting about it, and I think what the community agreed at, is that the Kubernetes platform did a really good job of embracing, you know, how do we give end users, developers, uh, kind of other partners a way to kind of extend the platform. So the way that I think about Kubernetes as a benefit for containers is you can use Kubernetes as kind of your base platform for what you're using to orchestrate containers ac across multiple hosts. But what its real value is, is the ability to kind of plug in other technology, you know, whether yeah. you're a network or storage or application developer, they, they are providing this way that you can kind of, you know, engage with the community um, and build off of that, which I think that, you know, that's really kind of what's fueling the ecosystem today. And that's kind of extended into kind of what the cloud providers are providing, where we've seen Google Cloud has their offering, Amazon has their offering, as well as Azure. So it's been really interesting to kind of see how, um, you know, from an orchestration platform, Kubernetes has really kind of taken off for the community. Yeah, you know, there's been a couple developments, uh, I guess, that that have had a lot of uh, voice or a, a vote has made the community vocal around, you know, I guess both Docker and community, I mean, uh, Kubernetes on the Docker side, you know, they had a, a license change back in, in September, or at least they announced the, the mm -hmm. license change. So, you know, those of us that run Docker desktop and have been doing all that, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, we're going to start charging for that. And, you know, I mean, it's their product. That's fine. You know, you go, but that, that uh, is a forcing factor for a lot of people to, uh, you know, abandon ship and, and find something else uh, for, uh, for their local development. So, you know, containers are bigger than Docker, even on a local desktop at this point. Uh, what, what other things are out there besides Docker, uh, for, for the developer who wants to get started? Yeah. 
So, you know, specific to Docker, you know, some of the things, as you mentioned, is that, you know, Docker is both kind of a technology, but Lender is, you know, a commercial entity of it as well. And, and to your point, you know, Docker Desktop is one of their commercial offering. And uh, I know many people, companies use that kind of enterprise solution. But from a community perspective, um, to your point, uh, the concept of containers has grown beyond Docker. So, you know, to me, there's kind of two interesting areas where I feel like containers has kind of shifted the way some of our technology has changed. One is, uh, I'm not sure how many people remember a company that was called Tectonic, uh, but they, they came out kind of during that um, uh, evolution of the Kubernetes platform. And to me, they were kind of part of that shift in redefining what an operating system is and thinking about if we're building operating systems to host containers, maybe there's kind of more streamlined ways of doing it. And they got acquired by Red Hat. And, you know, others have kind of followed similar platforms. If people are following like AWS, they have a solution that's called Bottle Rocket, where they are kind of also redefining, you know, perhaps we don't need all of these extra packages included with an OS if it's just going to run containers. So that's kind of one aspect of it that I've seen. On the other side of it, where I've seen the change is that, you know, you spoke to containers growing beyond Docker, there is a kind of a, I, I would say a community solution or Podman is kind of the name of it, where, and typically I'm seeing this generally more on kind of the server side, but the Kubernetes project themselves have kind of announced that they're trying to kind of move away from having, you know, Docker specific support and be more focused on Podman as a generic method of supporting containers. For most end users like myself, um, it pretty much is invisible. Like you, you probably, unless you're using something that's you know, Docker specific, you're not going to really notice a difference. But it is kind of to your point of just kind of containers have go, grown beyond kind of any one company, and you really kind of seen how the community has responded to that. Yeah, that was my my second point I was going to make, but you covered it already. Was the uh, <laughs> you know the the Kubernetes uh, change of you know hey. If you have this dependency uh, for for Docker, that in the next version is going to go away, and if you upgrade, that's going to break you. So, you know, but like going to you know the generic uh, container D uh, solutions um, instead of instead of that that um, uh, Docker specific. And you know, you mentioned Core OS, and and that's not much different than what uh, Five has done with F5 OS, right? It's that uh, abstraction, you know, Kubernetes layer that is is specifically designed for containers uh, so it's that that shift from you know the host OS and and uh, uh, that we have in in uh, you know big IPS through you know our current version 16 and uh, and yeah. and so f5 OS totally different totally different architecture and, and and many of the viewers may not know about f5 OS but that's kind of a good segue into kind of you know the section that we wanted to conclude on which is just kind of like you know how does containers, how does Kubernetes fit into the F5 ecosystem? And, you know, to me, um, you know, one of the, the most obvious one is through an acquisition that we had uh, a couple years ago is Nginx. So to me, when I think about containers, uh, Nginx is somewhat synonymous because if you've ever done kind of like a Docker or Kubernetes uh, tutorial, I feel like it's like the hello world of containers where you'll have an Nginx container, you'll be able to interact with it. And, you know, that's kind of for many people, their, their introduction to containers. And I've seen that also kind of evolve in terms of if you look at the Kubernetes project, uh, kind of the, the first ingress, kind of the way to bring traffic into a cluster is based upon Nginx technologies. And, you know, this is uh, an area where we're helping our customers with, you know, what's the best way to kind of optimize bringing traffic into your Kubernetes clusters. And that's a great thing about Nginx is that, you know, Nginx is very versatile. It can run on bare metal, it can run on virtual machine, it can run on containers. Um, so that's been kind of uh, kind of a, a great um, contribution that the F5 community has had into the container workspaces, you know, from from our Nginx family. And then you, you were kind of bringing up on the big IP side of F5, where has kind of container snuck in? And um, a, a common question I still get today is, you know, big IP we think about it as a hardware platform. 
you know, what does that have to do with containers? And oftentimes what we've seen with customers, especially if they're deploying containers in an on-prem environment, is that oftentimes you'll have a big IP that is kind of not running as a container. Uh, a big IP generally will run on hardware or a virtual machine, but usually we're the ones that are going to be bringing in external traffic from the outside world, maybe kind of protecting your containers, making sure no bad traffic's getting in, and then kind of connecting it to the container. So that's kind of like the, the, the first part of, of the big IP story. The second part is kind of what you were alluding to is kind of the, the kind of the uh, emergence or the next generation of big IP, if you will, where we're seeing on the Velos platform, and if you're not familiar, Velos is the name of our newest hardware platform. We have made that shift, you know, you mentioned core OS to shift the core operating system to support container runtimes. And what that's enabling us to do is, you know, as an end user, you don't have to know how to run Kubernetes the same way you don't have to necessarily understand the, the, the core platform of our original platform, but it is the foundation of what we, we are using to build our newer platforms. And that is just kind of one of those examples where, you know, much like you and your probably your own day-to-day -day, uh, viewers are kind of experiencing containers and Kubernetes, it has also crept into the F5 world as well for the big IP. So I'll kind of pause there before I start talking about distributed cloud. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, on the hardware side, there's certainly a place for general compute and that that works for for most scenarios but like you mentioned having having you know maybe something at the edge uh where you uh, the, the data center edge not the the edge the edge uh although there's like 18 different edges right so um but to be specific like kind of right right in front of where you might be offloading you know tls and and doing other security or or you know data services uh, with that traffic having purpose-built hardware to handle that specific i may have lost jason so the guest may be now the host or i may have lost a connection if you can still hear me i'll just kind of conclude with uh, the next item i was going to talk about which is how F5's distributed cloud platform has embraced containers as well. And hopefully Jason will be able to kind of join us back in or I'll come back into the broadcast. So on the distributed cloud side, uh, we made an acquisition last year called Volterra, which has become the distributed cloud platform. And you can think of this as a SaaS platform that can run in F5's regional edges or POPs, or it could be a uh, software that you could run in your data center or in your own cloud provider as well. And what's really exciting about the distributed cloud platform is similar to how Velos has adopted Kubernetes as kind of the foundation for the platform. Similarly, distributed cloud is also making use of Kubernetes and containers as the foundation of the platform. And what's unique about this as well is that it also affords you the opportunity to host your container workloads as well. So the distributed cloud platform, uh, there's a kind of feature that's called App Stack. And one of the neat things about it is we call this concept virtual Kubernetes. So the idea is if you have a workload and you just want to distribute it out to multiple clouds, multiple data centers, multiple edges, you can you know, use the same tools you're familiar with like kubectl, just kind of deploy that and it will go out to the edge. So that's something that is uh, pretty exciting. So unfortunately, Jason has had a drop of internet. So I think the guest is now the host, which is kind of a funny thing. Um, I believe Pete Silva is still in the backstage, so he can probably close us out if we really need to go down. Uh, Pete, how do you want to roll with this? I'll also take, uh, if anyone from our viewer audience wants to, oh, okay. Boo is also joining us to kind of help out here. <laughs> oh, there we go, Pete. What's happening? Oh, back. there he is. Hey, that, that's what it took to get Pete back on is Jason dropping off of the live stream, but. Holy cow. 
Yeah. Never a dull day in Death Central connects, right? This is why you have to keep on watching is the, the thrill of the live show. Well, it's cool. We all just like rush together to jump on. We might as well bring on Vacation Boy. Hey, boy. <laughs> hey guys. Hey. Hold on here. Working at yeah, uh, what is that, 7 a.m. Hawaiian bad. time? It is awesome. 7, 7 a.m. Yeah, 7 a.m. Oh, Hawaiian wow. time. My mind's always on island time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. My so, apologies Jason, for you guys having to jump. No, that's hey, all man, right. Hey, man, that's yeah. what the bench is for. Yeah. Hard there for I, I, I was just rapping with just kind of, you know, my recap was just saying, you know, hey, like for me, containers was just about making it easier to deliver applications. We've seen some interesting things, things happen in the orchestration space. And then I just kind of done a recap of, nginx big ip and distributed cloud so you know boo i don't know if you want to roll the outro or jason if you have any final closing thoughts there i'm sorry i will i was uh, just setting up my lighting over here but uh okay. i thought that was cool i've been <laughs> i've been studying the the history of uh more so on the kubernetes side so it was mm -hmm. cool for you to actually wrap in the container side and fill that in a little bit more for me. I think that's something that people just synonymized containers with Docker and just thought they existed at the Docker point. And so uh, getting all that history has been pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for jumping in and doing that and, and filling all that in. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get uh, um, some hands-on time for Kubernetes with the the Dev Central community, maybe some labs or something like that. I was thinking about and getting people up to speed on the some of the technologies you were talking about with uh, Ingress as well uh, would be fun. Um, I should mention as well, we've got uh, the Dev Central Connects group on uh, the community platform, community.f5.com, and then from there, uh, folks can. Uh, catch up on some of the links from the show uh, that would have been shared as well. So thank you very much, Eric, for joining us today. Thank you. All right. We will, uh, we'll sign her off from here. Bye All folks. Right.